last week on the Al Nicoletti Show. Let's welcome him back to the show. Nate Hare, let's go, baby. What's going on, man? I got to keep the energy up because you are, I got to keep up with you, man. And But I'm ready to rock and roll and talk about self-directed IRAs. You should understand how self-direction works, whether you have an IRA or not. There's $35 trillion sitting in retirement accounts right now, over $14 trillion just in IRAs alone. That is a private capital source that you as a real estate investor should be tapping into because it doesn't tap into your credit and it's a relationship business. We don't want to give you the money out of your IRA because that's treated as a distribution. You want to buy and sell the investments in the IRA so you retain all your tax benefits. What's so great about that IRA is you just keep putting money into it, putting money into it. And then when you hit that retirement age, you can keep putting money into it. And there's some rules and regulations on who your IRA can transact with. You can't buy property from yourself or from certain family members, but as far as the types of real estate you can buy, you can buy any type and you can buy it anywhere. You can even buy it outside of the United States. As soon as you take money out of Wall Street and you want to self-direct it, well, now you're in a, in a world of alternative investments, alternative investments like real estate, promissory notes. So you're dealing with private individuals or private companies in most cases. What Nate you're talking about is is huge right now with the with the cost of living being higher than ever. Inflation is through the roof. You have to source to alternative investments. So IRAs don't disappear when you pass away. They turn into inherited IRAs. That would be your brothers, your sisters, aunts, uncles. They're supposed to only take distributions from the IRA, but they can't buy and sell things. Hey, you're speaking my language with the probate Macarena right there. It's the first time in our history right now that the average Average median income doesn't qualify for the average median home price. Right, and people want to make more on their return on their investments more than ever. What does a hundred thousand dollars do compounded at 14% tax free? It turns into $1.4 million without a single additional contribution. I don't have to put savings in there. I just need to keep my money working and keep it invested in deals that I'm secured by. And if I structure the deal appropriately where I get the money back and I can reinvest it in the year, compounding interest works well. Boom. We're going to leave it right there. Nate, you're the man. I appreciate you, Al. I appreciate your team. It's been a blast. Such a great jam-packed episode with Nate Hare last week, all about self-directed IRAs, what a self-directed IRA is, how you can leverage it, how you can leverage it with real estate, maybe getting into note investing or if you want to do any lending, and just explaining the power of of self-directed IRAs and what that Roth IRA could do. If you missed any of that episode, go check it out and check us out on all the platforms for podcasting. You name it, we're all out there and we'll put the QR code up there so you can follow us everywhere. And I gotta say, I'm so excited for this tonight. This is going to be a great episode with two guys that are up and coming and have been grinding the last three to four years in real estate, Juan Gomez and Jimmy Fuentes. And what I love about them is they started on one deal and it completely changed their business and they are rolling. And their story is so inspiring. I know that anybody that's either jumping in or that's been in this grind for the last couple of years, you can do it, they can do it, and they're going to talk about their story. I want to jump in on that, and I want to say just for opening thoughts tonight, we all know what season this is, and it's tax season. If you are not with a Cracker Jack CPA accountant and you got your bookkeeper together, you have to. This is the time to do it, especially if you're doing deals at high volume. You have a lot of cases. You have a lot of expenses. You need to get with the right professionals to make sure your business is aligned and that you know what you're able to write off, what you keep as personal, and have all those things segregated. Get that now. That is so important. Do not wait to the last minute. I can't stress how important it is to find the best people in the industry. Well, I got to tell you, I am ready for this episode. I got my pen. I got my paper. I got my nine o'clock energy tonight. I know a lot of people are going to be watching this episode. I already, I already know it already. So I'm locked and loaded. Let's rock this thing. Hey everybody. My name is Al Nicoletti. I'm an attorney here in Florida and welcome to the Al Nicoletti show where I bring on real estate, super investors, rising rock stars, movers and shakers, and leaders of clubs in their communities that educate, entertain, and inspire 
all things on Florida real estate and how we can always bring out the best in our businesses. Whether we are in the real estate niche or we are talking about the business mindset and what we need to have so we can either scale our business up, scale our business down, you know, name it. Think about the people that we have had on the show. We want to provide the most value to you on how to level up. And that's what we are going to do on how you can level up your business and your real estate business today. On my show today, I got the up and coming guys in the Florida market, and they are crushing it with deals going all over, whether it is wholesaling, pad split, Airbnb, short term rentals, you name it. I want to bring them on because I can't wait to share their story. So let's bring them on Juan Gomez, Jimmy Fuentes. Let's go, guys. What's up, everybody? Uh, uh, thanks for having us, man. What an intro. I'm trying to figure out who you're talking about, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's you guys. This is this is what I wanted to do. I, you know, and Jimmy, I don't know if you know the backstory. I reached out to Juan. I was like, man, you, you, the story of you two is so crazy after the probates that we've been doing and, and seeing what you guys have been doing with the properties. And I and I know we'll dive in on some of the, the big story of how it all started. But I, I just got to say, I'm, I'm really proud of what you guys are doing. Um, I love seeing it. I know there's a grind. There's a hustle. You've expanded your team with getting a, a TC and acquisitions. And um, I know that you will be inspiring to a lot of people out there. It'll be, it'll be a great one. So I, I got to say, guys, for those that don't know, I, how did this all start with getting into real estate, that first deal? Like, I, I mean, Jimmy, Juan, you guys go first. You tell me. Um, I, I might be guilty. I drug I drug one into this whole journey, but um, to give you a cliff note summary, I have a background in online marketing. I own my own agency for about a decade. I just got tired of dealing with clients per se. Um, I felt like my business was at the mercy of the success of their business. So if they weren't good operators, I wasn't going to be a successful business owner because even if I did my job perfectly, they were going to blame me. And if I did my job too good, they're like, all right, let's stop it. I don't need no more no more business. So it was like a double-edged said. sword. Like either way, if I did bad, I would get fired. If I did great, I would get fired. I was like, all right, this is not working. So I wanted to start my own business in that I could a business that I could control from A to Z, the full product. Not that I would depend on somebody else's business or execution. Right. So I started looking around. I almost got into credit repair. I'm like a credit wizard and nerd. Love credit, business credit, uh, which ended up being super useful in real estate. But as I was about to get into real estate, I saw a random Facebook ad from Pace Morby. And from my background in marketing, I used to work with a lot of course people and educators and whatnot in the marketing world. If you know the marketing world, they're usually the pioneers with anything online. So when I saw when he was talking, I just could tell that he was um, he knew what he was talking about. So I just called one. I'm like, hey, you want to get into real estate? <laughs> and he was pretty much like, yeah, I'm down. <laughs> so we just joined the mentorship and got started that way. And just from that one moment, I mean, that that changed everything, didn't it, Juan? Like yeah. from that moment, like Jimmy and you, you're partnering on deals and you're just like, I don't know what, I don't even know what I'm getting into with this. Like that just sprouted this, that's just transformed over the last three to four years. I mean, that, that moment for you was crazy, right? Yeah, absolutely. I remember like it was yesterday um, at the time I was working at Foot Locker. I was a manager at Foot Locker. I was uh, the manager of the Foot Locker in Times Square. And Jimmy, Jimmy just randomly texted me and was like, Hey, what's up? And I'm like, what's up? Me and Jimmy, we used to be roommates like long time ago before I moved back up north. And um, we always had like the entrepreneur mindset. We always wanted to hustle. We always wanted to be business owners. And I was always working, you know, a retail corporate job. And um, Jimmy, he was always grinding. He was always selling something on Amazon. He was always selling something on eBay. He's like, I'm not working for the man. I'm figuring this out on my own. So I I love that about Jimmy. Um, And when he reached out to me about real estate, I had no idea what he was talking about, but I know Jimmy's like one of the smartest people I know. And when he reached out to me about the opportunity, I was like, you know, like, well, what can I lose from it? You know, and yeah, it completely <laughs> changed our lives <laughs> for the better. Yeah. So, super yeah. happy that we, we, we did it, you know? Yeah. And, and I got to say, like, we got to talk about that first deal that you guys had. 
yeah. because I had no idea this was your first deal ever. But I want you all to share, like, what was that first deal you had that completely changed the game for both of you? Go ahead, Jimmy. I'll let you start off. Um, so from my marketing background, I just hit the ground running and I did a text blast campaign. By mistake, I text blasted 10,000 people all at once. <laughs> I meant to do like a thousand tests and and by mistake, I just test blasted too many people and I just started getting texts inbound. And one, I was just sifting through and just picking and choosing which one I respond to. And one lady was, she said, pay the taxes and you can have it. I was like, okay, <laughs> let me talk to this lady. So I started talking to her for a little bit back and forth and we were interested and I forgot what happened where I think I was just, she wasn't ready or I just didn't know what I was doing either. So, but eventually Juan somehow landed in front of that lead and he called them and he kind of picked it up and started the actual process of locking it up. But that's how the lead came into the, our world. And then Juan Javin, cause I don't know that side of the story. Yeah, so, so, so my side of the story, I call the lady up and she tells me I have this piece of land you can have it for free. So when I heard free, my ears were like, oh, my God, you know. And mind you, this is like six months into, like, trying to find a deal, you know. Like, we're new. We don't know what we're doing. I'm making phone calls on my days off. I'm still working at Foot Locker. Um, mind you, this hasn't happened again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's never happened again. So, so um I, she told me free, so I'm like, this has to be a deal, right? It's free, right? How could it not be a deal? But she tells me, but you got to pay the taxes. And I'm like, how much is that? And she's like, it's like a couple thousand bucks. I'm like, okay, that sounds doable. And it needs to go through probate. So when she tells me it needs to go through probate, I said, absolutely not a problem. We'll take care of probate from A to Z for you. And I had no idea what probate meant. <laughs> Good chance. I literally had no idea what the word probate was at all. But she's ready to give me the property as long as I do probate. I'm ready to do probate. And I had no idea what it was. So I called Jimmy up and I'm like, Jimmy, I think I found a deal. I think I found a deal. And he was like, I told him the deal. He's like, oh, I texted that lady a few weeks ago. I'm like, yeah, but you didn't lock it up. I'm like, I'm about to lock this thing up, bro. He's like, but she said we need to go through probate. What is probate? <laughs> and I think uh, at that time, Jimmy already had Googled it. And he already had asked because we joined uh, the Pace Morby uh, community, like he said, the sub two community. So I think he already had asked a few people what probate was, and they explained to him what probate was. And then, um, if I'm not mistaken, Jimmy, out of you kind of trying to search what it was, that's where we landed with Al, right? Somebody was Yeah, so Al. a little background, right? So this deal ended up being... Not only our first deal, but it had a bunch of different roadblocks and education and tools that we ended up learning from getting this across the finish line. And the first one wasn't even probate. The first roadblock that she gave me is you can have it for free. It's a piece of land that I bought a long time ago, but it's not even buildable. So you can't do nothing with it. Just pay the taxes. I'm like, not buildable. I don't know what that means. But the reason she gave me was this. There's no sewer connection to the water, so it's not buildable. In my mind... And the, the city was Orange City, Florida. In my mind, 99% of the houses in the area that she was have a well. So I'm like, I feel like sewer is irrelevant in this conversation. So she was half right. The land wasn't buildable, but it had nothing to do with the water. It wasn't buildable because it wasn't big enough. And the city wow. has a minimum requirement for the land to be buildable. But in my mind, I was like, I'll still buy it. One day I'll clear it and I'll park a big yacht in there just as an extra parking spot. Because it was like four grand. And I was like, I don't know nothing about real estate, but four grand is cheap. I'll buy one right now. <laughs> and so that was the first hurdle, which eventually the way I solved it is I used to a software called PropStream, but you could do this on Zillow, Google Maps. And I was just looking at the lot as she was telling me it's not buildable. And I noticed there's a lot right next to it. The boxes look exactly the same. And it was vacant as well and not built or nothing built there. So I was like, all right. Long story short, I found the guy. We ended up locking him up. So I fixed that. I had two pieces of land that if you put them together, it was now more than big enough to build a nice little house in it. I'm like, all right, perfect. And then we run into the roadblock that I had to go through probate. So I started calling around, calling around, calling around. And 
probate was very expensive at the time. And I'm like, well, there goes this deal because I'm not paying for probate. And this is not even actually, I think that I think you're right, Juan. I think that was first because I remember saying this is not even buildable and I'm definitely not going to pay for probate. <laughs> um, but I spoke to a buddy of mine. His name is Mike McKay. And we were just randomly talking. And he was like, what you got going on? And I was telling him, like, man, we got this deal. We almost closed, but it's a dud. We can't pay for probate. And I, I'm not going to pay for probate. And I don't even know if it's buildable. He's like, what do you mean pay for probate? Just talk to Al. He'll take care of it. And then you pay him at closing. I'm like, oh, yeah? I'm like, oh, let's go. So I called you, spoke to you. You kind of explained what probate was to me. I told Juan. And I'm like, all right, perfect. We got that solved. And then eventually I solved the second half, which was finding another whole guy. He was in California, a retired doctor. Anyways, it ended up being a whole thing, but that's that story. And, and, and the craziest part about this is I didn't know at the time when you called, I thought, Hey, like this guy, Jimmy, he's been doing deals like, you know, left and right. Like, I, I don't know like what the resume is of anybody that calls. And I'm thinking, wow, like, you know, that was, that was easy. Right. And then I remember talking to Juan one day and Juan was like, yeah, man, that was our first deal ever. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wait, what? You were like, yeah, that was our first deal. And I remember you you were like, that changed everything we did because from that, we were able to grow and do other things. You were able to take the assignment do or, or, or figure out, hey, if we could do that, we could do all these other things. And now it's catapulted into – you guys doing fix and flips, Airbnbs, novations, um, off that one deal that just changed it all. Yeah, that, that deal was just proof of concept. And that's literally what me and Jimmy needed. Me and Jimmy just needed like, man, let's just do a deal. Let's just do a deal. If we can get one deal across the finish line, we absolutely can get more. And man, that six months was so tough, right? It was so many learning curves. It was a brand new industry um, to the both of us. It was like super new to me because I'm very like monkey see monkey do. Like you just got to like hold my hand, do it once. And I promise you I can do it again. But, you know, nobody could really hold my hand in this situation because me and Jimmy never done a real estate deal, you know. Right. But I, um, just like, you know, through communities. Um, yeah. And then doing something with probate, which I didn't even know what probate meant at the time. And being able to do that. I'm like, man, if I could do something in real estate I never heard of, I could do things I heard of. You know, I've heard, I've heard of fix and flips. I've heard of assignments um, at that time, you know. So, yeah, the proof of concept was, like, the biggest thing for us. And we're like, man, let's find more probate deals. Like, we could just lock them up and send them to Al, and Al just does it for us. So we were like, yeah. So from there on, like, I love probate because <laughs> of you, Al. Hey, guys, I promise this is not a plug for Al. It's not. It's this not. didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. This, this is our first deal ever, for real, for real. That's crazy. It's still crazy to me. It feels great. I'm, I'm so happy for you guys because like there's so many people that jump into this for the first time and their first deal goes bad and then and it makes them discouraged. And for you guys, it was a catalyst. And let's let's fast forward three to four years. I love what you touched on, Juan. Learning curves. What have been some of the biggest learning curves that you have been encountering or encountered when really being in this real estate industry? Um, I, I'll start right off, Jimmy. Um, I think one of the biggest learning curves that really hit us was marketing. You know, we just thought that we can go get data um, from these data providers and just rip a couple phone calls, send a couple text messages, knock a couple doors, and the deals will come, you know? And, man, that's it's difficult. It's very competitive. Like, I had no idea how competitive this would be, right? Because you're going against all the investors in Florida, and you're going against – the whole world, there's so many people investing in the Orlando market, you know, so it's extremely competitive, but, um, man, like great. I think communities has helped us a ton, right? We just being part of like really great communities. Like I said, we're part of sub two. We're part of the REI SIF community with Tyler. Um, he's awesome. And he's yeah. helped us so much with like how to market. And that's probably the biggest learning curve though. Cause we literally like the first year, year and a half, two years, um struck we we kept like we got a couple deals here and there but it still was a struggle you know but now um that's probably like one of the biggest learning curves was just how to find the right people to market to and how to find them first so i think that's been like the bread and butter i want to i want to dive deeper into that a little bit to give a little bit more context um why i got into real estate 
I heard about wholesaling probably 10 years ago from a guy named Matt Terriot um, out of California, if I'm not wrong. I forget what the name of his show is, but he's been doing this for a long time. But to me, it never makes sense. Wholesale, you buy a house is 50% off. What are you talking about? What a scam. Moved on. Literally, 10 years later, I see an ad from Pace. The reason he convinced me to get into real estate was subject to creative finance. You could buy a house full retail or even overpay. And you could do many deals as long as they're cash flow. You make a bunch of money cash flowing. They get all their money. Everybody's happy. So I'm like, this is going to be a breeze. I'm going to be overpaying for houses. Who's going to say no? I'll just go to MLS. I go to Zillow, overpay for every other house. And as long as I could cash flow 500 bucks, I'm going to be rich. So that's why I got into real estate. And then we were abruptly <laughs> uh, battered when we got in. And eventually I ended up even wholesaling, which is funny. I could have started 10 years ago. But eventually I got into wholesaling and all that stuff. So marketing is definitely one of them. But I think something, a bigger thing for us was even more selling. We didn't realize how much selling and closing was going to be a factor in this industry. Um, we were literally thinking, I'm buying whatever you're selling. Like, what's there to sell? Just, okay, how much do you want? Okay, here's the money. That's it. But um, bring it back, Mike McKay. Shout out Mike McKay, which is the one that introduced me to Al. But... Um, I forgot how I even met Mike McKay, but he literally sat down with us and he was because I was in REI SIF. I think I met him through REI SIF and I was just telling him like, man, I'm not getting any traction. I think my data is messed up. And Mike and I knew each other enough that one, I was in REI SIF. Honestly, if you're in REI SIF, you're kind of like a data nurse. So it's automatically like your data can't really be wrong if you're in REI SIF. But he knew me and he's like, bro, you're a nerd. Like your data is not wrong. Walk me through your process. So I start walking. He's like, all right, what's your sales process? Like, I'm like, what do you mean sales process? Hey, how much do you want? Like, that's my sales process. And he was like, yeah, dude, like, I think you got to look into your sales process. And he put it into a very beautiful sentence that to this day, it rings to me. He's like, if they're not borderline or fully crying on the phone, you're doing your job wrong. Mm -hmm. And it kind of made me look back to the conversations that I was having that there were basically arguments, FUs, like get off the phone. I'm like, all right, they're very far from crying. So whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it wrong. And he gave us a great crash course that we still use a lot of it today. But um, I think that was one of those big hurdles that one, you got to learn how to market very effectively. I think REI SIF is a great starting point for people that are starting to learn, especially at a low budget. I mean, the money that I spent at the beginning over six figures compared to what I spend now under a, a thousand bucks a month and a whole marketing channel that generates probably 10x what it did back then. So and that's all REI SIF and Tyler Austin. But then once you start generating those leads, you got to know how to close them. You can't just you got to stand out from all the competition. Yeah. And shout out to Mike McKay. That was an amazing connection right there because I got to meet these guys right here. And uh, Tyler Austin, for those that don't know, this guy is killing it with his CRM with marketing software, REI SIFT. If you haven't heard of it, check it out. An incredible community on Facebook. And everybody is a giver. Everybody's dropping comments. Everybody's providing value. If you don't know where to go, it's it's an amazing community, and these guys are on it. And uh, I know Tyler's watching. You know, let let's talk about this, guys, because like you said, marketing was the biggest one of the biggest uh, uh, learning curves. And with marketing, you got to keep yourself organized, right? And that's what the REI SIF software was was helping you guys with, right? Right, helping with the high volume. Staying organized, but being able to market, whether it's doing mailers or being able to keep your dialers together or just being able to keep keep track of uh, the go, no go process that Tyler talks about. Right. So yeah. having these things in place was a game changer. Um, and and uh, Jimmy Juan was telling me you're the software guy. So you you see a lot of the benefit to having that um, Juan on your end, the marketing now that you look at it better than ever yeah because back then 
And I, I think it's, it's like maybe even like a common thing in the industry is, you know, you have thousands of thousands of thousands of prospects, you know, people normally say leads. I like to say prospects a lead to me is somebody that shows motivation that wants to sell their property. But um, most, you know, people, gurus, everybody talks about having thousands of properties and then you you just going out there and negotiating a, a deal, you know, but it's um it's like Jimmy said, it's extremely expensive to have thousands of records. It's extremely expensive to skip trace a thousands of people. You know, it's extremely expensive to send out a thousand mailers. It's extremely expensive to pay people to go knock on thousands of doors, right? And the, the truth is, um, you know, bigger companies doing this at a huge high level, they have the experience, they have the marketing dollars. So they're crushing you already from the from the get, you know. So um, one of the things that Tyler taught us that was a game changer was like, you don't have to try to compete with these guys. Like you could take a more sniper approach and like hunt your prey, you know, like in a very strategic sniper way. So you don't need thousands of leads or prospects. You need a few. You need to find the right one and, you know, take your shot, you know. And and when we, when we fell back to that, we're like, man, this is not going to work. Like we went from, like Jimmy said, text blasting 10,000 people to like, we're working on 50 prospects today, you know? But sure enough, it did start working. And we're like, oh my God, look at this. And we're just learn how to get to prospects first, right? Because that's another thing. People that are focusing on bulk normally don't have uh, the, the the strategy to be first. So instead of going bulk, we went we went to the strategy of being first. It's hard to be first. Yeah. Going after yeah. too many people. First yeah. to market. Yeah. Tyler talks about that all the time. He, I think he has challenges on that. Yeah, he just, had one. he just had one. We were part of it. It's super cool. But yeah, man, a lot of people that are focusing on the first to market strategy, they're killing it. You know, they're killing it. First you told market. Jimmy when you go do the challenge. Now I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy's just trying to get it right now. I, so, you know, I got to say. With all the marketing, whether what whatever deal you're doing, you're always thinking, all right, what are we going to do with this, right? Like it's great. We're getting 50 prospects in and what's the strategy? And in this changing market, you guys are having to think more than ever. I'm like, well, wait a second. We got to analyze this. Are we going to wholesale it? Are we going to do a novation on it? Are we going to do seller terms? Are we going to do uh, a pad split? You know, and, and I go on Instagram one day and I see Jimmy like he's like filming like all the, the lamps and lights that, that you guys have that you're going to you're going to use for the pass flow. I'm like, what is going on? Like, you know, you guys got to really think about a lot of these things and get creative about what are we doing with these deals? So how are you guys analyzing that from the acquisition point to know what exit strategy you're doing? Um, so putting my nerd hat back on, um, I've built basically a pretty good calculator, the base of it back to Tyler, like Tyler, a lot of it we get from him, but the base of it came from him. And then I just started adding a lot of our exit strategies within that calculator. So once we input the property information, the comps, and we just do a little bit of the rehab data, it kind of tells us other different exit strategies, but honestly, Lately, it's just been kind of simply a, a pattern that I've noticed from when I started was like overcomplicating stuff, thinking I might know better than other people. And then the more I get to it, I just keep simplifying and simplifying and and doing less and less. So nowadays, honestly, we look at wholesale first or cash. Um, second to that is probably a novation. Um, and then. If there's no equity or they're in a very tight spot, maybe even negative equity, then we go creative. And then if it's creative, we go either Airbnb, but Airbnb is very specific to the market, the type of property. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to dismiss that strategy within without even running numbers. I just got to look at the property and where it's at. All right, that wouldn't work. So really, the only other option is just co-live in or pass split. Um, so those are really the three or four strategies. That we're kind of looking there's a bunch of other ones that if need be we might tap into but with those fours you're pretty much covered yeah to add a little bit to that you know me and jimmy we decided that we're like you know what we're young like we kind of want to take calculated risk now not later 
And um, we, we want to try to monetize properties as much as we can, right? Especially if we're keeping them. So that's why we're willing to do Airbnbs and that's why we're willing to do pad splits. Um, we can easily do a traditional rental, right? But a traditional rental probably cash flow is a few hundred bucks, you know, and some people will be super fine with that, you know? Right. Um, but you know, when you decide to go with a more complicated exit strategy, it comes with more cash flow, which is what we're looking for, but you're dealing with more headaches, right? You're dealing with more people. Like somebody just sent me a uh, message today me and Jimmy, like, Hey, I'm outside the house and the door's not working. Like, okay, let me go unlock it. You know, the door is working fine. They're probably just entering the code wrong. Right. But it's okay. We're willing to deal with that because they're paying us a premium to stay on our property where, you know, if we just had a renter there. We probably won't even hear from them for every six months, you know, which, but we'll make 500 bucks, you know, right. when, we, when we go with these extra strategies, you know, sometimes, you know, we're making a couple thousand bucks cash flow a month. So we're like, you know what, let's take on the headaches now that we're kind of young and we're willing to, you know, work around the clock. And maybe down the road where we're like tired landlords, we're just like, you know what, we don't want to deal with none of this. We'll just put tenants in there and we'll just relax, you know, but right now our exit strategy is like, how can we monetize this the most? Okay, pad split. We can monetize it the most. We're pad split in this thing, you know? Yeah, and let's talk about pad split because this has been one of the hottest topics. More people are posting about it now on Instagram and, and the social media platforms about how they picked up a property and now the cash flow is even going to be more than a long-term hold or, or a short-term rental. And I think it, it had to gain a lot of traction at first and now it's starting to really get out there where – uh, the people on the ground, the the investors that are like, you know, three to four years in were really starting to be like, hey, I, I'm going to do a pad split. What has been your pad split journey? What have you guys learned about going through a pad split deal? We're newborns in it. We are literally just getting started. Uh, we bought our first property that we plan to turn into that um, back in – October, give or take. And we started a rehab process and we just finished it, I think, December. And so there's to clarify what we're doing with our property, we're doing something called co-living. The easiest way to explain it is co-living is the industry, the same way that short term rental is the industry that Airbnb is inside of. Got it. Meaning Passplate is the platform, the Airbnb of co-living, but there is more than just Passplit. You could do co-living on your own, self-managed. There's all kinds of things, bed and breakfast. If you do longer, technically anything that you could put multiple people in one building, it's considered co-living. Um, so that property we are attempting to do co-living on, um, not specific pass split, but the property set up the same way it will be for a pass split. But, um, but we're still learning. We're just finishing that one up. We have another one that I'm finishing up tomorrow. Um, I have a third one in Daytona that recently just got finished. And then I got a fourth one in Daytona as well. Um, that one we'll probably put in pass split just to test it out with pass split. But um, we're brand new. One thing with us is we're not scared to experiment. We're not scared to experiment. I will even dare say lose some money. Um, because it just we've we've learned that it kind of pays off sometimes to make these bets and just to see. How it can work yeah and, and it's worth taking the risk right juan i mean at this point yeah. why not try it and see what what are the goods uh, i mean are we going to lose a lot of money by paying too much on costs and and all the other stuff or should we now say you know screw it i don't want to go do that let's go back to wholesaling yeah yeah definitely calculate a risk you know and, and thank god for us um like we know we're like a lot safer on like the rehab side of things number one my dad's a contractor so he does a lot of work for us and then we have another contractor that we met that is a father of a friend of ours and he's been doing a lot of work for us so at least we know we're not going to get screwed on that end where a lot of people like are very like skeptical about like contractors um so we're like super safe on that side so i think that even gives us like we're able to leverage that um but the the, the reason why we really love the concept of pad split when we first started hearing about it or co-living better said is because we're, we were in the Airbnb um, market like a couple years now. Right. And we saw Airbnb go through the roof and then we saw it get stagnant. And then right now it's kind of like a little bit of a wave, you know, like it's still like not 
bad, but it's not as good as it was like a year and a half ago. And like, we're just look at things, right? The economy right now is kind of like, we're like in a whole state of like, where is it going to go? Everybody's kind of a little bit skeptical, right? So we, we looked at our Airbnbs and we're like, man, Airbnb, if you really think about it, most people are going to rent a house when they go on vacation, right? So it's more of a luxury thing, you know? Co-living is the opposite of that, right? Co-living is individuals that want to rent a room out in a property. They're willing to share common space because they're on a budget or they want to put themselves on a budget so that they are saving money in this like economy that's kind of like up and down right now. So we're like, man, this is like extremely recession proof if we get there, God forbid, or, you know? So where in Orlando right now, if you were to go rent out a studio or one bedroom, it's going to easily be what, 1500 bucks right now. And then you have light, then you have internet, then you have all this other costs associated with it. Where right now, in like co-living, you can rent a room for seven to eight to nine hundred bucks. You know what I'm saying? And everything's included. You know, um, water. You got laundry. You got internet. Uh, we, we're paying for the gas to get cut. We're paying for the plumber if the toilet leaks. So it's almost like a no-brainer. You know? So we're like, man, like we love this concept. You know? Because and, and you know, I'm a New Yorker, right? New Yorkers been pat on um, co-living their entire life. For- last hundred years because of how expensive things are right and i always tell this to jimmy like growing up everywhere i would go visit a family member they have somebody living in the basement you know right. you don't call it co-living but they're just like yeah of course i rent my basement out like who does it you know but that's like the most common thing up here in the north because of how expensive stuff is you know in florida i think those markets right now are kind of getting to that point where they're like man things are kind of getting expensive like what? Where, where can I live? What can I do? You know. So that's another reason why we wanted to kind of dive into this industry because we feel like it's very, very recession proof. Yeah, and I remember the episode I had with Jeff Weller, and Jeff was talking about how like there are certain types of requirements to being able to do the co living, like the either the size or the or or the different rooms. Now you got to create, um, and you have to really make sure this property fits that parameter of being able to have co-living opportunities um, and because you don't want to do something <laughs> and then have an issue with code enforcement or permit issues. Um, so you have to be careful there. And um, the other thing I noticed too about you guys is I remember there was one probate um, I got done and I remember looking at the house and I was like, wow, that's a nice fix and flip house. And I'm thinking, hold on a second. These guys knew they they could spot it a mile away that this is fix and flip, and I thought, wow, it's it, it's it's fascinating seeing it uh, that you can see that deal and you're like, we're gonna go this strategy. And I even felt the same way when I saw it. So you guys know how to how to really pick and choose. That's gonna be a fix and flip. This is gonna be a pad split. You already know intuitively. I'll be honest, Al. It's a lot easier than that. The property tells you it needs to be this because if not, it's not going to work. It's way less than I need to pick this magical strategy. It's usually more like this is the only thing that will work. Because it's usually like they don't want to do stuff to creative, hold the mortgage on their name. They don't want to sell for a low cash offer. Novation is really the only way that I could give you your price and I might still be able to make something. You don't have any equity. You don't have any room to even do that. Your negative equity. You have to do creative. And if you have to do creative, back to what I was saying, either is the best property for Airbnb because of the location, property style, or it defaults to co-living. So they almost self-select. We never try to fit a square peg into a round hole. The property is kind of just, we're looking at it like a kid, like a little box. And all right, this is a circle. It goes in a circle. Like we're not trying to force it. The only thing I would add to that a little bit is like, we, we do at least wanted to say, like, worst case scenario, we could just rent this thing out. You know, like, worst case scenario, we could rent it out. And even if we were, like, breaking even for now, that's, like, again, calculated risk that we're willing to take. But like I said earlier, we're looking to try to monetize as much as we can right now. So that's why we're focusing on the other edge strategies. Yeah, and I've heard some other investors where they can't make the deal happen. They're doing novations. How has been your experience with dealing with novations in this market? As far as pitching just, them or just doing them or just getting into them and dealing with the whole process because it's it's not a wholesale. 
Um, the, I mean, right? It's not. It's not. But you're trying to maximize the value of that of that deal. Yeah. Um, Novations, honestly, I think might be the future of wholesaling, if you will. Um, it's damn near the same thing. It's just a very technicality type driven term and strategy for the only sake of being able to wholesale to a retail buyer, a.k.a. somebody that's using traditional financing. And the only reason that's happening is because banks don't like assignments. So it's just a legal terminology and strategy. It's the same thing to me in my brain. I'm wholesaling it. Got it. Yeah. It's just a legal paperwork. All right, I'm doing an ovation. I'm not doing an assignment. I'm wholesaling it, but I'm not even wholesaling it to an investor. I'm wholesaling it to like the end user. And that's why innovations kind of work because the end user, right? Uh, an investor that buys a property, they need to buy it where they have to make profits. Right. No investor out here is buying a property where they're not going to make a profit. Right. It wouldn't make sense unless you're buying it for a buy and hold. Right. Where you'll make profits on the rental, which right now um, refinancing a house is a little bit difficult. Right. Um, because of the interest rates. Right. So for you to cash flow with uh, market rent in today's interest, it makes it a little bit tougher. I'm not saying the deals aren't out there. They are definitely out there if you look for them. But um I think that's why like novations work, right? Because you're wholesaling it to the end user. So that end user doesn't need to see profit margin, you know? And sometimes that end user even gets a slight discount and in their mind, they're like, perfect. I'm going to use that to rehab what I want to rehab in the property, whether it's cosmetics that they want to upgrade themselves or whether the property just needs a little bit of TLC, you know? But um, yeah, that, that's interesting. You said it like that, Jimmy. I, I didn't think about it being like the future, but that makes complete sense. Yeah. Look at that. Because you could wholesale an ovation. Yeah. Like if I lock up a contract, an ovation contract, I can assign that. So it almost makes assignment or a wholesale contract useless. You could almost start with an ovation and go whichever route you want to go with it. I know we know people that take novations and they only market them to investors first. Naaman Taylor is one of them. So they take an innovation contract, they put it on investor lift first for a week or two to only investors. Crazy. And if they can't assign it, then they'll put it on the MLS because it's, again, it's just a technical term that is just wholesale repackaged. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is what I definitely wanted to touch on with you guys on the show with some of these creative ways um, being in three to four years, I mean, you've, a, you've been able to see um, a, a pretty good spectrum of different strategies you can implement because uh, maybe the margins are too tight, the equity is not there, the equity is there, um, we can do co-living. And I, and I want the audience and the viewers, listeners to see that even if you pick up a deal and you think, oh man, I don't know if this is going to make any money – Maybe pick a different strategy and and go that route and say, well, wait a second, maybe you'll cash flow more doing this or or doing a, a seller terms deal, right? Uh, it's just it's having that open mind right now on what can we do. And I'm always thinking about like, you know, what are some people doing with the probates? You know, are, are they are they are they holding it? Are they doing an Airbnb on it? And a lot of times, who knows? At the end of the day, it's about what's going to be the best strategy for everybody, you, the end buyer, the seller, the whole the whole system. And that's what you guys are thinking through on all these deals. And I love it. Uh, Juan, you were telling me about this crazy story of this fix and flip from a year ago, uh, this Habitat for Humanity uh, situation. Let's hear this crazy story because we always love wild stories on the Al Nicoletti show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this uh, <laughs> it, this is this is a crazy slash funny slash like learning curve, and thank God we had the knowledge we had for this deal. So, um, I'm I'm doing my I'm doing my calls one day, and um, I come across a pre foreclosure. It's in Castleberry, Central Florida. Um, and and I speak to the guy, and the guy tells me. Oh, this is my brother's property. Parents passed away and I already went through probate. I was like, okay, cool. So I was like, let me get your brother's phone number. So I start calling the brother. Um, so I speak to him a little bit and he ghosts me. So he, he stops picking up my calls for like a few weeks. 
So one day I'm like, ah, oh, man, I really want to try to get a deal. I want this deal. Let me call him off another number, right? So I call him off another number, and boom, I catch him. He picks up the phone, right? Like, I knew it. this guy was ghosting me. So I'm like, hey, man, what's going on, man? Like, you want to sell it or not? Like, you're in pre-foreclosure. Um, unfortunately, you know, you told me already you can't catch up the payments. And before the bank throws to auction and you end up losing even more, like, you know, let's figure out a deal. So, boom, he, he says, all right, that's, that's fine. Let's figure out a deal. So we get him under contract. So then once we get him on the contract, I felt so bad, bro, because the guy's telling me, man, I hope we can close on this quick because I was trying to sell this before, but the property was given to my parents through Habitat Humanity. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? He's like, you know that nonprofit that gives away houses? I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember, like, seeing commercials, you know? And according to, according to what other investors have told me in the past, you can't sell it for a profit because of Habitat of Humanity. So I was like, there's technically a first route of refusal the Habitat of Humanity has on yeah. whether if you want to sell a property, they have the first route of refusal to buy it. And if you have a wholesale price on it, they have the first route of refuse to buy it at that price. That price. Yeah. Ooh. So we learned that. We learned that through the deal, you know? So I was like, hey, man. Whatever hurdles we come through, don't worry about it. We got this, right? We'll, we'll, we'll give it the best shot we got, right? That's what I told him. I was like, if anybody could get this done, it's us, man. We'll give it the best shot. So the guy's like, all right, man. I trust you. So cool. So we get him on the contract. The guy texts me that same day. Man, I really hope this goes through. I'm like, I told you I got you. He's like, I don't even have money to eat today. I'm like, man, you don't have money to eat? I, 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 I told Jimmy. He didn't even know this. I don't know if I even told Jimmy. So I'm like, hey, man, what's your cash out, bro? I cashed up with my 100 bucks. I'm like, man, everybody should eat, man. It was Easter weekend as well. So I'm like, man, get you some good food, man. Like, you know, on the house. Cool. So yeah, then. Two liter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Jimmy says two liter. So then the next week rolls around and I'm like, hey, by the way, my partner is going to swing by, you know, just to check on the condition of the property. He told me the condition over the phone. We just want to verify everything is good. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. Man, the condition I told you over the phone is the condition it is. Like, we're good. You guys don't have to come by to look at it. So I'm like, whoa, red flag. Like, what do you mean? Like, nobody makes a decision for hundreds of thousands of dollars while looking at the house, you know? So I tell them, I'm like, hey, man, I'm telling you right now, if we can't go look at the house, like, deal's off the table. Like, 100%. Nobody, whether it's me or anybody, nobody's going to buy this thing without looking at it. And he's like, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm like, go for it. The reason why I don't want nobody coming to my house is because I don't have any running water. So I'm like, okay, what does that mean? You know, you are oh, running water. So I'm like, all right, uh, we're not there to use the bathroom. We just want to check, you know, he's like, well, the truth is I pee inside two liter bottles <laughs> and I have them stored in the house. <laughs> so I'm like, man, this guy is like, Nah, I don't believe it. So I'm like, about it make him feel bad about it, right? I'm like, listen, dude, you're telling me you're peeing two liter bottles and you have a couple stashed around the house. We don't care. We just want to go make sure that the property is like, it is what it is, you know, as far as the condition. Like, I said, you know what? On top of that, when we do close on this thing, you can leave all the piss bottles in there. We don't care. Like, we'll 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 have our crew like take care of it. But I'm legit thinking like, there's no way, you know? Like, I don't know, something's not adding up. But anyway, I called Jimmy up. Because, you know, I live here in Jersey, so Jimmy. Any, Jimmy. any local brunt <laughs> and headaches, this guy. If you guys are looking for a partner, man, just have him <laughs> be in the state. <laughs> you guys Love it. So I said, Jimmy, this guy said there's a couple of piss bottles in there. I don't even know what that means, but go check it out. Jimmy sends me a picture a few hours later. This guy, I don't know. He was, like, collecting these things, man. This guy had how many piss bottles, Jimmy? Probably over 100. <laughs> and the biggest, my biggest... <laughs> Baffleness is like, why weren't you emptying it in the bag? Like, I get it, you were using it temporarily, go empty it. No, he will like seal it up and put it in the corner. Like, he'll just keep adding to them. I'm like, what's going on here? I know you got trash, trash doesn't stop. So, I don't know, he had a bunch of them throughout the whole house. And yeah. these are real, this is a real deal, yeah, it's a super real deal, yeah. So then. I'm like, hey, man, what's going on with the water? Like, why is the water running? He's like, well, you know, like I told you, I lost my job. I don't have any income, and I can't. I couldn't afford the water bill. I'm like, man, how much is the water bill, bro? 
He's like, it's, I don't know. I'm like, give me your water account. He gives me the water account. I called him up. It was only like a few hundred bucks. I'm like, Jimmy, let's let's pay this guy's water, man. Like, everybody should have running water, man. Come on, you know? So we pay for his running water, and he gets his water turned back on. He's super happy. He's calling me saying, man, I appreciate you. Uh, man, you guys done more for me than anybody has done in the last couple of years. Like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm like, hey, man, no problem. No problem, you know? So then he hits me up a few weeks later. We're still waiting for, like, you know, things to come back. And he's like, hey, I need another 100 bucks. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa slow down. Like, this is not how this works, man. Like, I hooked you up the first couple times. But, like, closing should be coming soon. Don't worry. And the cool thing about it, he had a bunch of equity in the house. I think he had, like, 100K, if I remember correctly. He had, like, 100,000 in equity. So if this thing were to go through, he's going to get 100 grand, you know? And, um finally like our title person was so awesome went through leaps and bounds leaps and bounds trying to figure out this habitat humanity thing we're calling habitat humanity trying to find out what's really going on and finally after like a month habitat humanity says you guys are good to sell like we don't want the house so we're like yes 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 so i call him i have man i have the best news for you Habitat humanity said you can sell it to us. They don't want to keep. They don't want to. They don't want their first right of refusal, right? So that was like the, one of the biggest hurdles in the whole deal. And as soon as I told him that, he says, "Oh man, that is so awesome." My buddy, that's a local realtor, just advised me that I'm selling this house way below market to you guys, and I no longer want to sell it to you guys. I'm just gonna list it with him. Oh. <laughs> I bet Jimmy's wheels are really turning then. He's like, no, I visited that house. We're getting it. But well, uh, Jimmy's the calm one out of the two, right? I'm I'm the, I'm the, oh, what? what? <laughs> are you crazy? Even though I'm not even in the piss infested house. <laughs> I was more pissed than Jimmy. And I'm like, no way. So I call him back and he just starts forwarding all my calls, all of them. So... The cool thing about how we send our contracts out is, you know, Jimmy being the nerd he is with all the software stuff is whenever our contracts get open, we can see that in live time. We get an email notification contract has just been open. And if you forward that contract to somebody else to open it, it shows us the email address that got forwarded to and who opened it. So literally after that, he got off the phone with me, I see blah, 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 blah at gmail.com opening the, the contract. So it was like the guy's first and last name. So I Googled it and I put realtor at the end and I put Orlando and boom, he came right up. So I'm like, oh, so this is the guy that's trying to like destroy our deal right now, you know? So I'm like, cool. So I call up Gio, right? Gio is like our right hand man. He Gio is like awesome. He we call him transaction coordinator, but he does everything for us, you know. Gio. Yeah, Shout out. Awesome. Yeah, I love Gio. He's probably watching now. But anyways, I called Gio, and I'm like, Gio, did you follow a memorandum on this? He's like, absolutely, as soon as we signed the contract. So I'm like, yes, yes. So I call, so I called the buddy up. He's like, hey, da-da-da, realty at your service. How can I help you? You know, I'm like, hey, man, you're, like, trying to steal my deal, bro. Like, Who's this? I'm like, blah, 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 street. You're trying to steal my deal. Oh, that's my client and a friend of mine, and I have to protect my clients. Don't call me back. Click. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'll call them right back. I said, listen, I'm just letting you know right now, as much as you want to destroy the deal, have fun. We have a memorandum of contract on this thing. And as soon as you try to go sell it behind our back, we're going to block the deal. And it's going to be a pretty penny for us to lift our memo. So have fun. And all I saw for like the next 20 minutes was our contract reopening in the email. He was just opening, <laughs> opening, opening. And in our contract, it says we have the ability and the rights to file a memorandum. You know, so he calls me like a week later. When's closing? I'm like, gotcha. You know, like you <laughs> thought you were going to catch us, but we got you. You know, <laughs> um, I'm like, well, what happened with your buddy? I don't want to talk about that. I'm like, all right, cool. Closing is this day. They thought they thought they also were gonna get out by the closing date, but the way we write our closing dates, it says on or around XYZ date. That's um, a big nugget. That's a big so nugget. It's not, it's not just that day. It's like, all right. And within there, there's another term that says if it's no fall of the buyer, the contract auto extends weekly. 
It ain't our fault. So our contracts last for eternity until you want to sell the property. Unless it's our fault that we're not closing. <laughs> it's our fault that's different. Look at so, that little strategy. That's helped us a lot too, right? Originally, the reason why we put that there was like, you know how probates are out, obviously, right? You're the probate wizard. Um, as, as, as much as we want to get the probates done in like super timely fashion, at the end of the day, you do your job correctly. And then it's pretty much on the court. Or, 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 right. It's on the basketball court of the courts, right? Right. right. It's out of your control at that moment, right? So what used to happen when we were like still newbies is all the time, like we think that probate would be done in three, four months or, you know, a couple weeks and it doesn't, right? Of, especially in Volusia County. Like you always tell me like they're so backed up, right? So then the title companies will always have to tell us, hey, we need an addendum. Hey, we need an addendum for closing. Hey, we need an addendum for closing. We need an addendum for closing. So we're like, man, like we hate sending these addendums out. Like sometimes it's hard enough to get these people to sign the original contract. Now we're chasing them down for addendums, you know? Right. So Jimmy came up with this bright idea. I'm pretty sure it was between Jimmy and Gio because Gio is like a contract wizard. Um, they put that auto extension in there and then the auto extension help us out too. Right. So we don't have to get these addendums. And then if they try to ghost us, like th this guy does, it just keeps auto extending, you know? And then the on and around a title company told us that title company is like, why don't you just put on and around around is like forever. <laughs> you know, that. like what's that was, around? That was Matt Larson. <laughs> that was Matt Larson. Okay. Um, so yeah, on or around, right? Around for me is two weeks. Around for you might be two years. <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, that's, that's a cool nugget to share with the audience there. And that just helped us on a deal that we're doing right now that probate went through for like eight months, and title didn't even ask for an extension. Our hard money lender asked for an extension, and I was like, Hey guys, I took a screenshot, I highlighted it. I'm like, we don't need an extension, it already out of extends, and they haven't asked for nothing since they're already clear to close and everything. So it's not just title the ones that can give you grief is your lender as well yeah, yeah 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 so so yeah so that guy he 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 pretty much he was trying to jerk us out of the deal you know obviously we're investors obviously and i we know super transparent from the beginning we're gonna buy your house we're gonna fully renovate it we're gonna put it back on the market we're gonna make a profit you know but at the same breath you're making a hundred thousand dollars dude you know but yeah. you know everybody's nice until it comes down to money. Like and that's what this industry really is. Right. And that's why you have to protect yourself with contracts. So the guy, you know, he pretty much had a, eat his own words and yeah, he went to closing sign, got his hundred thousand dollar check. So he was super happy. So we were able to help him, even though he tried to um, not help himself with us. And then, and then, yeah, we were able to fix and flip that property. You know, it was a really, cool fix and flip and um then we made like 50 grand on that one we made like fifty thousand on that deal so we were happy you know look we at that happy, so yeah and, and it's just it's it's going through these headaches right like juan you talked about it. it's just like it's figuring out the headaches of the deal but as long as you commit and try it's taking that action and following through with it it, it's it can it's gonna happen. It's just you got to get through these little bumps in the road. And I love what you guys are doing. And 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 you know Jimmy, like you're seeing it on the title end. You're seeing it on on just so many ends with what to do on the strategies. And Juan, you're talking to all these sellers and 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 figuring out and bring and and uh, it's it's finding the solutions solutions, not the problems to these deals is what makes the difference. And I love what you guys are doing. Uh, I I gotta say. Um, at the end of my show, I've been doing the signature questions. So I got to ask both of you certain signature questions. So let's rock this thing. Uh, what do you look for in new hires? Um, what do I look for in new hires? Honestly, I just look for energy. Like I'd rather take somebody that doesn't know nothing about nothing of the, in, of the, of the industry but just give me that energy. Like if you give me that energy, like everything could be taught, everything could be trained, you know? Um, but energy can't be, you know, energy to me is like the most important thing with any connection I do. Cause I'm, I'm huge on energy, man. Like me and Jimmy, I think that's like the reason why we clicked so well when we did like back in like high school days, like huge energy, you know? So the answer to that is energy for sure. I love it. I love it. Um, uh what was the best advice you guys heard when starting out with real estate? <laughs> <laughs> you got, both. 
best advice. Oh uh, man, I can't even think of one specific thing. <laughs> the- <laughs> it's definitely a real. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's just so many. It's like it's not. It's like saying like, "What's the one thing you need from a sandwich?" Like, no, I need all the bread. I need the lettuce. I need everything. Like, I mean, I mean, this is this is this is one thing that stuck with me, especially when we didn't have a deal yet, right? Uh, Pace will always say, "If you put the work behind it, you'll find the deal." But even if you don't know what you're doing, the world will give you a low hanging fruit deal, meaning. The world just gives you a deal just because you've just been trying. Like it's like every investor I feel like gets a free, gets a couple free deals a year. If well, maybe you just get one. But even one free deal. When I say free deal, what I mean by that is like not so many roadblocks. You know, not so many headaches. Right. Like, but you only get that prize if you're really going for it. If you're really trying. You know. So I just told myself. I kept telling myself we couldn't find a deal. Where's my free deal? Where's my low hanging fruit deal? Like I was promised this deal, but it's so true. But you only get that through like consistency and, you know, all the stuff that everybody talks about, but you can't expect to like, just get a lucky deal here and there, but the lucky deals are out there, but you're only there if you put the work in. Great. Hey, it's hey, love hearing that. Uh, Jimmy, this one might be more for you. I don't know. Juan, you tell me. How are you leveraging social media for real estate business? Yeah, that's Jimmy right there. Um, social media has helped me a lot with networking. Um, I I think real estate is probably one of those industries that are very networky heavy. Um, I've never heard about networking from any other industry, and then you get into real estate, and there's a meetup every other week from ten different people. So, um. The first thing that has helped me there has been with networking, where when I enter rooms, I'm just getting started. And even then, people come up to me like, hey, I saw your videos or we spoke on social media. I'm like, yes, we did. So it's just um, people are warmer to you. Um, It literally just happened to me a couple of the last meetup that I went to this week with um, Javier, I think was his name. Big co-living guy has like tons and tons of property, but. In general, people just respect you a little bit more because um, not only are you doing real estate, but you're showing them what you're doing, what you're learning, your headaches, your mistakes. And something I learned from Grant Cardone, some people love him, some people hate him. But one thing I said one time that was super obvious to me, I'm like, that's so stupid. And why do people like, like people expect to get supported by their family, friends and helped out and whatever, but they never tell them what they do it's like a secret like a little tiny secret that nobody knows about and then they are surprised that nobody's helping them or giving them referrals or hitting them up there like somebody just randomly wrote me today hey you want a jv on this deal don't remember if i ever spoke to the guy but if he didn't know that i was doing real estate or i don't even know how he knows me but he just reached out so basically a lot of opportunities come to you from just putting yourself out there um, and all those things that I mentioned don't require a big following. All those things will happen to you, even if you have 500 followers, 100 followers, because of those 100 followers, 500 followers, most likely are local people that when you do go to those networking events, they will recognize you from your content and they will approach you and speak to you. So you don't need a million followers for all those things that I mentioned I to happen to you. Yeah, love it, and I I see what you're doing on social media, I, the 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 Jimmy reels, right, Juan? The the Jimmy reels and talking about pad split and and uh, getting into all these crazy situations. Uh, I can only imagine that it's really helped with community networking, strengthening relationships, and getting more deals. So again, love what you guys are doing. I love those answers all I, the way around. I love I love what Jimmy's doing because he puts me as a collaborator. So all I got to do is hit accept, and I posted it as well. And then when I go out and about, my buddy's like, man, you're killing it, bro. I'm like, thanks, dude. I appreciate that. <laughs> Ripping off it. I love it. I love it. Juan, and all my videos, half of them don't even have my face. So, yeah, you can play it all. <laughs> Juan's having a great time. I love it, guys. I, I think that what you guys are doing is fantastic. And I know a lot of people have been uh, commenting on the show. So, uh, she- Shelly. Shout out to Shelly. I hope you're still watching, Shelly. Say hi to John for me. Uh, Teresa, love Teresa. She goes, I'm loving this. You want to do real estate? Yeah, I'm in. You already had trust. Nothing more needed to be said. 
you know? So you're, you're, you see what's happening right here. Tyler, Tyler's watching. So there you go. He's watching. Uh, my, my guy, Chris Aleman. Let's go guys. Jimmy Fuentes and Juan Francisco Gomez. Look at that. He had to say it right there. Mac Jose. Wow. I haven't heard from Mac in so long. Look at it. He's watching REI SIF community guys. Um, Chris had said, worst case scenario, you can turn them into broth. <laughs> crazy. You guys are crazy. Um, I don't know who this is. I don't know if it's Nitro. I don't know if that's Geo or uh, anybody out there. Uh, and then Teresa said, best advice, call Al. Th- you know, the thing is, what's so great about call so- Al. It's like Sal. <laughs> medical. Yeah. Medical Al. Call out. Uh, I got to tell you, what's so great about social media and being on the podcast is like, look at the engagement that you guys have for watching and, and being here. And I mean, this is great. I mean, you have you have the guys in, in REI SIFT. You have Tyler watching. So there's a huge collaborative community effort that's happening by doing these shows, by having this. And this is what's so great about having uh, you guys on. I got to say, as I do at the end of my show, I do a segment called Final Words, Final Thoughts. Anything that you really want to hammer home, we haven't talked about, one last piece of advice that you want to give everybody out there, this is your moment. Final Words, Final Thoughts, Juan Gomez and Jimmy Fuentes. Juan, go first. If it ain't difficult, it's not worth doing. Um, I might cheat, and it might not be that concise, but I'm going to do two. The first one is... Doing it is like 90% of the battle. We literally just closed the deal the other day that took us a year and a half or a year. I don't know how long it took us. But I was just thinking like just being in the business for that. Like most people aren't even in the business for that long. So there's how many opportunities are you missing on just because you're not even around? Not even a skill thing or a luck thing is you're not there anymore. You gave up. So it wasn't nothing special. We just followed up a year and a half later and we got the deal. So That was one big lesson. And the second one is there's always somebody that has gone through whatever problem you're going through. So being part of a good community, it's super major of getting help. And real estate, there's honestly no excuse. There's many communities, but the top two that I will obviously recommend is one subject to amazing. I have zero regrets of joining that. That is very high ticket. Um, 10 grand. I think it was when we joined. I don't know what it is nowadays. That was when it first first started. But honestly, even Tyler is like doing the God's work on the other end because Tyler is providing that type of knowledge and community. The community is free. So you have no monetary excuses. You could join RESIV community for free on Facebook. He has weekly Zoom masterminds that are free. Again, no excuse. You don't even have to have his software. So that's the biggest thing that I would say. Any issue you have, just share with your community and somebody will come out the woodworks and help you. Yeah, love it right there. I think that's fantastic advice for people because there is always somebody that's been through that problem before. It's a matter of you asking, reaching out, and making that connection, right? And and just being able to talk about, hey, like you never know that the ne- that person could be the next person you do a JV deal with, or maybe they're wholesaling it or you're wholesaling it to them. You never know. Build relationships in this community. Guys. I, I loved having you on. This is so great. I get to see Juan really for the first time. Jimmy is seeing you again. It's it's. I, I think the value you guys provide and what you're doing, keep going. Love what I'm seeing. And uh, I'm going to see you guys out there. And Juan, Juan will call me about a probate next week, and I'll see Jimmy at an event. Oh, board. Bro, I got a couple I'm working on right now. I got a couple I'm working on right now. It's <laughs> real soon, bro. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. All right, guys. I will see you soon. Thank you for so much for coming on and being on the show. Thank you for having us, brother. Of course. I'll see you guys soon. All right. Take care. Have a good one. All right, everybody, if you missed any of that episode, go back, check it out. We're on YouTube, uh, Spotify, iTunes. Click the link tree right there. If you want to think about getting into real estate or you're in real estate and you're like, well, wait a second, I need to pivot on on deals and get more creative, and I just got to get out of that shell and just do it, this is the episode that can really help you think outside the box. And there's some golden nuggets in there about how investors are structuring their deals, contracts, how they're doing things with closings, you name it. Watch the episode with Juan Gomez and Jimmy Fuentes. You don't want to miss it. And we, of course, 
We will see you next Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern. You don't want to miss it with the great Alicia Jarrett. I can't wait to have the Aussie back on the show from season one. It's going to be a banger. I'll see you all next Wednesday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Have a great one.